it was very painful because nobody understood what Bitcoin was. And most people thought that, that Bitcoin was a Ponzi scheme. No matter how sophisticated the technology you've built, if you cannot communicate well, then there's going to be this huge communication gap. And we cannot turn vision into reality. Was the sacrifice worth it for you? There are two set of options that we, we have to choose to live our life. The first option is the average life, where you optimize for comfort and ease. And another life is where you, you optimize for adventure and off service. So I would rather have a, a life of adventure and off service than a life of comfort and ease. Top Jirayut Sapsi Sopha, founder and group CEO of BitCup Capital Group Holdings Company Limited, the largest blockchain and digital asset group of companies in Thailand. He is one of Thailand's youngest leading Bitcoin and open blockchain experts with more than eight years of experience in the blockchain industry. Top is also an executive board member and vice president at the Thai Fintech Association and a subcommittee member at Thailand's office of the Trade Competition Commission. In this episode, we'll dig deep into his story behind how he built BitCup, one of Thailand's few unicorn status businesses, and understand more about the mindset he had while building the crypto scene in Thailand from scratch. Also, stay tuned until the end for a quick sneak peek tour at BitCup's headquarters in Bangkok. You won't be disappointed. Without further ado, let us introduce you to the person responsible for making cryptocurrency legally recognized in Thailand, Kun Top Jirayut Sapsi Sopha. Sadiha Kun Top. Sadiha. Thank you very much for joining us in this interview and actually inviting us to your beautiful BitCup office today. Very honored to be here. Thank you. It's a great pleasure. I know you have a very busy schedule ahead, so I'm going to launch straight into the questions. So BitCup is one of Thailand's very few unicorns. Can you tell us in a nutshell how it all began? Um, personally, I've been in the uh, cryptocurrency space for, for eight years now. And BitCup is actually my second uh, crypto company. My uh, journey started uh, in 2013. I founded one of the very first uh, Bitcoin uh, wallet company uh, in, in Thailand. And after four years uh, of running the first startup, uh, it was sold, eventually sold to Gojek. And after, you know, uh, after that, uh, uh, I participated in the Thai, uh, the f very first uh, SEC's uh, FinTech Challenge program. We tried to create a stock exchange 2.0. Um, back then, four, four years ago, um, the stock exchange of Thailand could not do instant settlement. It was T plus three days. So we created a new generation of stock exchange where, where users can instant uh, you know, set, uh, settle stocks instantly uh, and we came out as a winner from that competition. So after winning that f very first fin FinTech challenge, I started to fundraise and gathered all the people uh, that I know from the blockchain, the cryptocurrency space, space which, which was very small back then, uh, to, f to join together and, and create a BitCup. Um, BitCup has been around for uh, four years and, and ten months now, uh, and we we are one of the very fa uh, fast one of the fastest growing uh, fintech startup uh, in the country. Now now we have two thousand employees. On average, we have been growing at a thousand percent every year. Apart from last year, we did two thousand percent growth wow. uh, last year. So we did uh, you know, mi miracles um, uh, so far. Miracles indeed. Do you mind if I go back to the beginning in 2013 when you first started coins.co.th? Is that the company? Um, how did you know that cryptocurrency was worth investing? And how did you convince people even in Thailand when nobody believed in cryptocurrency to, hey, come and join coins? Um, my, I started my first career as an investment bank, banker in, in a boutique a very small boutique investment banking firm in, in Shanghai, in, in China. 
um, I was in the pink sheet uh, penny stock uh, market, which uh, it is, which has less, um, much less regulation. So usually stocks are very volatile. And one day at the at the desk, I discovered this new financial asset called Bitcoin. The price went from eleven dollars uh, up to one thousand one hundred fifty dollars in a short period of time, ten thousand percent. So. Uh, so I was int intrigued um, um, about this new new asset and started to read up more and more and and I was so lucky that I stumbled across a blog written by Mark Anderson called Why Bitcoin Matters. It, it was a random blog post back then, but now it's a New York Times classic you know article. But I got to see the other dimension of of Bitcoin. You know, Mark Anderson is 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 the the guy that. He sees a new technology at, le at least a decade before everyone else does. He, he founded Netscape when he was a university student, sold it to Microsoft. And then he did uh, cloud computing 10 years before Amazon does. And in 2013, he wrote a blog uh, called Why Bitcoin Matters. And he invested in Coinbase, he invested in Bitcoin. So I got to pick his brain, brain um, and saw the potential of how Bitcoin technology can bank the unbanked by using a phone that is connected to the internet. The unbanked, underbanked uh, population in the, uh, you know, especially in the ASEAN region, can get access to better financial services. And with Bitcoin technology, it, al it allows micro payment to happen for the first time in human history. Um, so I was convinced. And, but the first job didn't last very long. Um, my first job last um, about two and a half months, and then I started another career as a a, a financial consultant in, in San Francisco. Um, after a week into my second career, I, I, I found out very early that this is not what I want to be doing for the rest of my life, research work. But I was already in, uh, at uh, SF, San Francisco. I started to ask around if anyone knows uh, people that are working in the technology space. One of my friends introduced me to uh, an, an ex-executive of PayPal called, uh, his name was Dan Chat. I uh, took him for uh, brunch at a pan pancake shop and I asked him uh, the same question, what do you think about Bitcoin? Dan was like, uh, top you are the luckier generation. I still remember th that conversation. Top you are the luckier generation. The the original vision of PayPal is not to be just a mundane payment gateway. They wanted to to create a digital dollar, but but the infrastructures uh, weren't ready uh, when they were started. They did not have cloud computing. They did not have um, fast internet, four uh, G fiber optic internet. Um, they did not have blockchain. Um, whereas in 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 my generation, in, in our generation, we have blockchain, we have cloud computing, we have 4G, we have you know mobile phone, mobile driven a, a nation as a country. So the infrastructures uh, are, are are much uh, are more are more ready. And he said Bitcoin is going to change the financial landscape. So after that uh, brunch, I booked a ticket back home and started the very first Bitcoin company here in Thailand. I, the, the second job lasted about two weeks maybe. Then I booked a ticket back home. Um, the very first Bitcoin company was started in a clothing shop. My, my parents, uh, they, they sell clothes uh, at the uh, Pratunam Center. We have a small clothing shop. So I asked my, my parents for a spare room to turn that into my own office. Uh, that was where coins got started. Um, it was a one-person office and I was the CEO, chief everything officer. So I, I did everything from incorporating the company, you know, marketing operation, customer support, um, you know, accounting, uh, legal compliance. Um, it was very painful because nobody understood what Bitcoin was. And most people thought that, that Bitcoin was a Ponzi scheme. I still remember this official letter from the Bank of Thailand uh, issued to all the commercial banks in 2014. 
uh, saying that uh, the value the value of Bitcoin could go to zero zero anytime. Do not go anywhere near it. That was an official letter from the Bank of Thailand warning all the commercial banks not to go anywhere near near Bitcoin. When I first started the, the company, we had lo lots of fights um, uh, within the family, especially my my dad. They they sent me to a very good school. I, I graduated from from Oxford University, one of the very top school, and most of my friends got a very well paid uh, uh, job, huge paychecks, and I was doing this thing uh, in a one person company that the Bank of Thailand said this could be a potential Ponzi scheme, so did not that did not go well with my parents, but. For some reason, I did not want to give up. I keep saying or sharing this vision to my parents that, you know, Mark Anderson said this is going to be the the next big thing. I met with the, an ex executive of PayPal. He said, "I'm the luckier generation. This is going to change the financial landscape." So we had big fights, um, and we. But eventually, um, you know, we coins uh, the company gradually grew uh, along with the industry um, and we moved to a small co-working space uh, uh, the, f the first two employees were my cousin because <laughs> nobody would want to work with me uh, for many reasons right um, f when they came for a job interview there there were clothes everywhere it's, it's definitely not a financial company it's a clothing shop right there's, uh, there's only one person in the company, myself, and I was 23. So even though uh, I had the money to pay, nobody wanted to work with me. So the first two employees were my cousins. I had to pay my, my, my cousins to, to help me jumpstart the, the project. But we eventually grew, and then we had issues uh, along the way, uh, so many crises. We had, uh, Crisis with the anti-money laundering officers uh, about uh, the re reporting standard of Bitcoin, um, like seven years ago, because no financial institutions uh, ever, uh, you know, send a, a Bitcoin report, tra Bitcoin transaction to an anti-money laundering officers before. So we had to set up this new format of the uh, reporting standard for the cryptocurrency transaction in the country. I tried to call, called, uh, I, I got this investigation letter, uh, invited uh, myself to, to the, the AMLO office. I called my friends who went to a good school together, who, who went to a top law firm. Nobody wanted to help to take the case because uh, Bitcoin was gray, right? very gray uh, back then. There, there were no regulations. Um, nobody understood what it was, um, and I still remember coming back from uh, the uh, AMLO office, anti-money laundering office uh, officers meeting. Half of my employees left the company <laughs> after they realized uh, that the company was being investigated, and then another crisis struck. Uh, the Bank of Thailand also sent me an investigation letter. They were saying things like, do you have any uh, payment license, remittance license, you know, um, e-wallet license, operating this kind of business in, in the country? Um, it was in a gray area. Um, are you creating a competing currency? Nobody understood what it was. Um, so we, we had to educate um, the regulators educate the, the public um, and also educate the, uh, you know, the team, employees, everyone to build an ecosystem. We were one of the very first uh, uh, early adopters of, of the Bitcoin uh, and, and blockchain te technology. Even the RD, the revenue department, um, we had to educate um, them on uh, how to pay taxes with the um, Bitcoin transaction because we were the very first case study for the country. What was the mindset that you have to have 
during that time of so many obstacles of the Bank of Thailand, the Revenue Department, anti-money laundering, and your father too, right? So there is like the public and private sectors like pushing you. How, what kind of mindset did you have to have to continue going through these hardships? Um, uh, perseverance is, I think, the key. Um, characteristics of um, of all entrepreneurs, regardless of the industry you're in, all entrepreneurs have this same characteristics: perseverance. Perseverance is number one for you. Yeah. Mm. The ability to handle pain. You have to have a very high pain threshold to be an entrepreneur. Right? To turn uh, vision into reality, and and mostly. People around you will question you. Uh, you right? will question your vision. Um, you, they're not going to be supportive um, all the time. But you have to stick to your vision, and and just do not give up. Right? And 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 don't let the outer voice change your inner voice. I have actually listened to some of your talks before, and I learned that you were actually not very fond of school from a young age. And it's only very late in life when you went to college that you started studying. What was the turning point that you were like, you know what, I want to become an entrepreneur. I need to get serious with my studies. Um, actually, I never thought I would be a, become a businessman. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be a footballer. That was my childhood, childhood uh, dream. I wanted to, to play for Manchester United. Oh, wow. Um, uh, 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 I was gonna. I was always have a a big dream. I wanted to be the first Thai footballer to play for Manchester United. So as as a footballer, that's a big, huge dream. And another character when I was looking back uh, at myself, I wasn't conform. Um, uh, for example, uh, when we I, I was playing football with with my friends. Uh, uh, and and when I lost, I I just create my own team, create, set up my own rules, buy my own football, uh, get get a new ball, uh, invite people to join me on a new team, setting up my own rules. I wasn't conforming to to the system when I was when I was young, um, and I hate losing. <laughs> those, those were the three uh, characteristics. Um, and then I wasn't a good student up until uh, I, finished, I finished my high school. I could not get into a good university. Um, and that created a, a very bad uh, impression on, on me. Uh, that I could not get into a good university. And it was a bit, it was too late because the grades already came out. Um, so I decided to give, uh, to look uh, uh, at the UK universities, um, the UK system. And fortunately, Manchester University accepted me as a student. Um, actually, my, I was following football for most of my life. Yeah, even universities, I was choosing football teams for the five choices. On the, on the UCAS system. And Manchester United is my favorite team. I, I decided to go to Manchester University. Um, but, you know, after that, you, you, you have a, a second chance at life. And, and after you, you, you know, I, I failed at, at, at getting good grades. Uh, once you experience something, your, your mindset, you know, changed. Um, so I experienced this um, uh, failure, and I decided to to try my best now um, after that experience. And I was willing to give up everything, everything just to achieve that uh, that goal. Uh, my very first goal uh, in life was to get into a good university, top university. So you know, from uh, I remember the first day at uni, I went straight into the library, 
try to study, try to revise. I was sitting still for four hours, five hours, six hours, every day up until 12 hours, 14 hours per day. I did not go home during Christmas. Manchester was like a ghost town. Right? Uh, it was, uh, we had this white Christmas in the UK. It's snowing, very heavy snow. I, I was walking through snow to the library every day, not talking to anyone for three months. Studying every day, seven days a week. Um, and I was able to get good grades for the first time in my life. And I managed to get into uh, Oxford University. So I think I learned three, three, I learned a few crucial lessons uh, during my university career. Um, uh, the first lesson was sacrifice. I, I learned um, the importance of sacrifice um, early on in order to achieve your goal. We cannot have everything. Uh, everyone has 24 hours, seven days a week, very limited time, very limited talents. We can't have everything. We have to sacrifice in order to achieve what we want. I did not have a, a normal university life. I did not have any uh, relationship. Uh, during university, I did not go partying like other teenagers. I was just camping out in the library seven days a week uh, for five years. You know, my, my passion is football. I was in the UK for five years and I only went to one football game in those five years, even though Old Trafford is in Manchester United. Right? Manchester uh, United, sorry, Old Trafford is, is in Manchester City, right? the university. We're in, we're, we were in the same city. It was a, just a short uh, bus trip, but I was in the library the whole, the whole time. Um, and um, I learned about perseverance during my university career. Um, I, it was so painful to sit for 12 hours, 14 hours every day, seven days a week for five years. Five, five years. Um, so I was learning uh, on how to handle pain very early on. Do you mean physical pain as well, just sitting there? Um, yeah, everything so, mental. Yeah, everything. Uh, sacrifice, the ability to handle pain, perseverance. Um, um, in order to achieve the the goal. And at Oxford, I learned a crucial skill, uh, the ability to, to teach yourself. Right? Because we were studying with uh, all the Nobel, Nobel laureates. And I thought that was a good thing before, but they're not very good teachers because their brain is works in a different way. Right? They, I cannot understand uh, anything in, in class. I had to teach myself, and that was a, a crucial skill, continuous learning, and the ability to, to teach yourself, learn, uh, to be able to learn new, new things. Um, so I was re reading economics at university, and another, I think, important dot or experience in my life uh, was this class, economic class, uh, that called the history of monetary system. So I got to see that money changes, money changes every 50 years. And after a crisis, the evolution of money from a you know, bartering system, shells, gold standard in 1929, the Great Depression, up until 1939. Um, then we had another system called Britain Road system in 1945. And then we had uh, fiat currency in 1971. So money changes every 50 years. So I get to see the evolution of the medium of, of exchange. So I was able to connect these different dots and skill sets and able to maybe understand Bitcoin a bit easier than you know other common men. Mm -hmm. right? that money will be digital uh, going forward. So maybe it was that class combined with Mark Anderson's book that, made, that really convinced you that cryptocurrency is here to stay. 
And actually, I wanted to go back a little bit when you were talking about self-learning and how you realize that, you know, Nobel laureates, they're, they might be great on paper. I mean, like their minds are obviously brilliant people, but the way they communicate is a little bit hard for laymen or people to understand. So do you think that was also a crucial lesson that you took when you had to re-educate the authorities in Thailand, what cryptocurrency is all about, the way you talk to them? Can you tell us perhaps like, how did you manage to convince such people and you know, like in Thai society, how there's the Puyai culture, like I'm older than you, I have more status than you, I have more power than you. How did like basically a 20 year old kid convince such authorities like that? Like what techniques did you use? Um, it took me more than 1000 stages in the past eight years, trying to educate different stakeholders, um, different entities, organizations about Bitcoin and blockchain technology. I, I, I am already becoming the, the, this crypto, space, uh, crypto face uh, for Thailand because I've been on so many stages trying to share the vision to educate the, the market, the stakeholders, the, to build out the proper ecosystem. I think another very important skill for leaders is the ability to communicate and most of the leaders um, overestimate this uh, their skill um, communication is very hard right um, no matter how sophisticated the technology you've built if you cannot communicate well then there's going to be this huge communication gap happening and and we cannot turn vision into reality. Um, so uh, the important skill is to be able to humanize technology, um, to master the communication and also to humanize the, the technology. So, you know, common man, layman can understand and be able to utilize uh, the newest uh, technology. Um, I'm still having, um, it is very hard to, to share vision and to educate uh, the public about you know, future technology, especially um, when they haven't experienced uh, uh, new technology before on how you know, these new technologies is going to improve the society or uh, the the way of life. I'm still struggling even today. Do you think the intergenerational communication gaps and all, it's more pronounced in Thailand than it is in Western countries, in your opinion? Um, no, uh, this is happening everywhere, um, not just in Thailand, this intergenerational issues. Because in the past 10 years, um, the world is moving, was moving so fast. Uh, there is this digital divide happening, not just in Thailand, but everywhere. Those who are able to master the technology would reap the benefits. And another segment would be falling behind and not benefiting from adopting or understanding the latest uh, trends or technology. And there's a, this aging population happening uh, worldwide. Um, we have a much older uh, generation, uh, generation of uh, uh, workforce. People work longer. People have a longer career and they age well. Uh, people age better. We have a longer life expectancy. And there's this huge struggle of power between generations. This is happening everywhere. And not just technology issues, but in terms of um, inequality uh, or democratization of opportunities or environmental issues. Um, this is happening worldwide, not, ju not just on the technology side. I would love to learn more about your philosophies or your beliefs 
in how to manage such a huge company like this? Like, what are some core beliefs or core philosophies that you use to run this company? Um, the first philosophy, uh, the, f the first belief is if you want to achieve extreme success, you have to be the minority that it, that is right ab about something that the majority of the people are wrong. Um, because most people think in the same manner, act in the same manner. They would share the same market share. Um, but if you were the minor minority that is right about, very right about something that most of the people are wrong, then you would achieve tremendous, more than average success. How would you know that you're the minority that's right though? Not the minority that's like, oh, maybe we're going off track a bit. By connecting the dots backwards, like Steve Jobs was, Steve Jobs was saying. Um, everyone has their own dot, dots, experiences in life, and you have to find this important truth yourself by connecting the dots backwards in your own manner to find this important truth that uh, most of the people would not see or get it wrong. Um, if we were to look at other industries, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, they were the minority. They were the very few that was right about computer, whereas the majority you know, did not care about computer um, when they were started. The two men built out, built out the whole operating system. Right? Or Jeff Bezos, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, you know, they um, they were the few that believed uh, about the internet, whereas the majority uh, uh, did not care. Even just, just looking back ten years ago, when the smartphone revolution was happening, nobody would think that sharing homes with strangers would be a good idea, or sharing cars with strangers would be a good idea. But Brian Chesky, Chesky was the minority that was right. So he achieved extreme success. Because people would think in the same manner, act in the same manner. That's the average performance. If we are to achieve beyond average performance, then we have to be the minority that was very right about something that the majority are wrong. What was your personal truth that you believed in then? So by connecting the dots uh, backwards from personal life experiences. First of all, I took economics at school. My most favorite subject was the history of monetary system. So I get to see the evolution of currencies. There was a unique experience that not everyone see or experience. I stumbled out of all the blog, uh, blog post stumbled across a blog written by Mark Anderson um, early on too, like 10 years before everyone else discovered Bitcoin in 2013. So I get to see the other dimension of how Bitcoin is going to change the financial landscape. I met with Dan Shap, an ex-executive of PayPal, rubber stamping this vision that uh, Bitcoin is going to change the financial landscape. And I was born in a I would say I am one of the lucky sperm club. Lucky sperm club? Yeah, because <laughs> my uh, sorry to be rude. <laughs> it's but, okay. <laughs> but my my parents they don't need me to look after them. Ah. I can afford to. I have this freedom to fail. Mm. Right. Even though we had big fights in the family, I know that at the end of the day, if it doesn't work out, I can just sell clothes. Mm. Uh, you know, carry on my parents' business, family business. So I was lucky, in a way. Um, so these are, and also, I wasn't conformed when I was a, a child. I was, I did, you know, uh, training at university. Uh, I was, I learned how uh, how to uh, how to sacrifice. I learned about perseverance early on during my university career. So these are all the different dots. Mm -hmm. I did not know that Manchester University was training me to be an entrepreneur. Mm. Because one of the most important skills is, for, as an entrepreneur, is the ability to sacrifice 
and perseverance. Um, that was the most valuable lesson I got from my undergraduate career, not economics, but I did not realize it that you know back then. But these are the different dots that was forming me to be who I am, without realizing. Um, so I think everyone must uh, find their own important truth by connecting connecting their own dots backwards in in their own manner. It, it is not something, uh, it has to be authentic. Right? Yeah. This might be a non sequitur uh, question, but I know that you grew up in a fairly normal childhood situation, and now you're kind of the face of blockchain, cryptocurrency, people think of you. Everybody knows you, your face is everywhere. Has it changed for you at all in your day-to-day -day life, like going out, meeting people, knowing that everybody knows who you are? Does it feel strange sometimes? Um, yes. Um, obviously, your privacy is gone. <laughs> yes. You cannot have a normal life. Mm -hmm. And you have to be accountable for your actions. And, and the company's action because you're the, the face of the company. I, I am the face of the company. I am accountable for my own action as well as the company's action. Um, it's the sacrifice you have, who you have to make as, as a founder, as a CEO. Um, and the reason why I was putting my face up um, was because I was studying these different great companies and they don't they are usually you know um, um, CEO facing companies like if you look at if you talk about Apple the first person or the, the face right the first face that we would think of is Steve Jobs we cannot think of any promote other promoters of the company or if you talk if we talk about Alibaba the first face that you would think of is Jack, Jack Ma, Microsoft, Bill Gates, um, Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg. We could not think of any actors or actresses as the face of a great company. So I, I think um, we have to sacrifice. We have to sacrifice as, as, a, as a founder, as a CEO, especially in a, in the fin in a financial space. Bitcoin has only been around for four years and ten months. We haven't had a, a hundred years history of you know reputation building and trust mm. uh, with this society. So the best way to display trust, uh, to show uh, you know to create rep reputation, uh, to build trust with the community is, is to show transparency, to show who's behind the company, who are the backers of the companies. Um, we have to have this. Soul. Like we have to bring, create soul, a soul for the company, so the customers can relate to the company as a person. The person can, uh, customers can relate to the story uh, of the company, and that is what differentiates us from other exchanges, other other companies. Mm. I, I agree with that, that actually people do gravitate towards stories and faces like that. And interesting that you are saying it's all about sacrificing as well for you because now, because you are the face of the company, your privacy is now gone and you were talking about sacrificing during, um, how to call it, in college where you didn't have any hobbies, you didn't even have a girlfriend. Was the sacrifice worth it for you? Yeah, um, for sure. I mean... If I have to go back and redo things, I would probably choose um, uh, to do it again. Um, it was in uh, it, it was my lifelong goal to to get into a great university to experience what it was like to study at Oxford. You know, once in my life, I always wanted to build you know great companies, uh, you know, great company where uh, everyone is using the, your product. Um, or with your idea, you can create impact um, to a lot of people. Um, it was worth the sacrifice, I think. Um, I think you have to choose. Um, there are two set of options. 
that we, we have to choose to live our life. The first option is the average life, where you optimize for comfort and ease. And another life is where you, you optimize for adventure and off-service, or an entrepreneur life. So I would rather have a, a life of adventure and off-service than a life of comfort and ease. So I think it was worth the sacrifice. Um, but it was very painful. Um, it was a very painful, um, how long was it now? Eight years plus five, 13 years, mm -hmm. almost 15 years of no life. <laughs> but you're gaining a little bit of life back, hopefully now, a little bit. And uh, maybe a few last questions like, so what is the future of cryptocurrency and Bitcup in general for you? Um, we have to differentiate between short-term noise and long-term vision. Right now, the, um, the world everywhere is facing you know, a very high inflation, uh, highest in 40 years. So, so the main goal of central banks around the world is to bring inflation down to 2% uh, as fast as possible. So they are increasing interest rates everywhere to suck up the, the liquidity um, to reduce the inflation. And usually to reduce the inflation, it takes longer than creating the inflation. So I think in the short term, we would possibly be facing a recession uh, within a year, a year and a half. Um, and the economy would be uh, back up again in 2024. So the short term noise uh, that is happening now around the world with the war between Russia and Ukraine, the struggle of power between China and the US, the change of supply chain, the, um, uh, the hyperinflation, it's gonna cause uh, the equity market to go down, it's going to cause the cryptocurrency market to go down. Um, you know, people are keeping cash now instead of investing. So I think short term, uh, we have to uh, to be careful to not over invest, not over leverage, to keep a lot of cash and to improve on human capital. The best way to win inflation over the long term is to have higher productivity by bringing in technology and also human capital. Um, but over the long term, I have met with so many, again, I was lucky again to meet with uh, these different new dots, right? To meet with uh, one of the biggest funds in the world, in the region, and in the world. They share the same vision that blockchain digital assets are going to be huge. It's going to be one of the main growth engines uh, over the next decade. So that's one uh, dot, new dot, that reinforces what we, what we do. Another dot that uh, or insights that I got to experience is that in the next 10 years, ASEAN region is going to be entering our golden era where we're going to be having uh, investments from all around the world pouring into the Southeast Asian region as one of the top uh, investment destinations. Um, so there'll be a change of supply chain, green supply chain, digital economy, uh, talents, uh, rich natural resources. These are all the different factors that would be pulling investments into our region. So future is very bright for our country, for Thailand, and very, very bright for what we do, especially digital assets and blockchain. So um, over the short term, we may have to be cautious about spending money we need to keep cash and optimize for productivity efficiency. But over the long term, this in industry can only get bigger and bigger. And it's going to be one of the growth uh, dri dri drivers uh, for the um, uh, digital economy um, going forward. Um, there must be a, a, 
So the thesis is this: um, anything that can uh, that can be tokenized will be tokenized uh, in the future, meaning that you know, crypto digital asset is is beyond cryptocurrency. We can tokenize carbon credit. We can tokenize electricity units. We can tokenize bond. We can tokenize equity. We can do carbon credit trading. We can do electricity unit trading. We can do uh, secondary bond market trading by tokenizing different asset asset classes. This market is going to be huge. And if we are looking at different financial institutions, they are already entering this phase, quietly entering this phase everywhere now, um, entering this digital asset space. Um, so I think the future is very bright for what we do and also very bright for the region as a whole. But we have to uh, you know, go through this short term, um, survive through this uh, short term noise. Mm, I see. Good knowledge to have. And one last question, um, if you could give any advice at all to, say, the next entrepreneur who is looking to build a unicorn company, what would you give him or her? Um, for, for the, I would maybe separate into two advice. The first advice would be on the trends. And I think after I went to Davos this year, after meeting with all the different world, world leaders, the first ever trillionaire entrepreneurs is going to be is going to be on climate tech. Mm. The first trillionaire entrepreneurs is not going to be on blockchain or digital assets, but on climate tech. People are underestimating the the impact of environmental issues, um, and we haven't got that much time anymore. We only have eight years until this net zero requirements. Uh, is enforced by 2030. So I think the the sector with the highest growth would be climate tech going forward as an advice on, on the trend to, to future entrepreneurs. I mean, if I don't have Bitcoin to run, I would probably start a climate tech company. Right? And on the skills and mindset, um, I would advise uh, to have these important characteristics, like the, the ability to handle pain, you have to have high pain threshold as an entrepreneur, you know, perseverance, we all share this common uh, trait, um, the ability to, to sacrifice, as an entrepreneur you have to sacrifice, and also the, um, to stick to your vision, um, do not let you know, like Steve Jobs was saying, don't let outer voice interfere with your inner voice. You have to turn vision into reality. And not everyone would be uh, uh, with you uh, the whole time, right, throughout. You have to believe in what you do. Have, uh, you, know, you have to be fully passionate in what you do and, and have this perseverance to do it long enough to turn vision into reality. Um, so the, I think yeah, the, these are very important skills, no matter which industry you're in. That's true. Thank you very much for your advice and thank you also for taking your valuable time to uh, come and talk to us and to the audience as well. I'm pretty sure you guys got a lot of good knowledge from Kuntops and uh, if you like this content, do subscribe. Before we end this episode, as per my promise, here is the tour of the BitCup office. We were honored to have Kuntop personally touring us around that day. First and foremost, I have to say, I was really impressed by the amenities provided for the staff there. Besides the company's canteen, huge amphitheater, and the various creative brainstorming rooms, they had a relax room completed with massage chairs for the employees to sit and relax in. They also have masseuses and a hairdresser to come in and provide services for the staff on a monthly basis too. My favorite room though? I gotta give it up to the nap rooms, where employees can take a quick nap to increase their productivity before continuing on with their work. I hope you guys enjoyed this quick tour around the BitCup office and learned a thing or two from Kuntop. 
If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to smash that like button and subscribe to the channel for more contents like this. Until next time, goodbye for now.